Revelation chapter number 20. Last week we saw the beginning of the millennial reign. This week we're going to pick up at the end of the millennial reign. Because between verse number 6 and verse number 7, we don't know all that happens during the millennial reign. But we know that Christ rules and reigns over all the earth and that it'll be peaceful. Right? There will be no more sin. Satan's bound. Right? Cast into hell. Had a seal put upon him where he can't do nothing for a thousand years. Everything's wonderful. Then, verse number 7, what we're going to pick up, says, And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about. And the beloved city and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. And there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were open. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books, according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged, every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Now in verse number 7, I told you all last week that there was coming a time when Satan would be loosed to tempt the descendants that started with just 144,000. And there's a bunch of different metrics you can use to estimate. It's going to be a bunch of people. Okay? After a thousand years of peace on earth no war no fighting all that there is is the love of God and the order of God and the direction of God things are going to be fruitful okay well at the end of the th thousand years the millennial reign Satan's loosed out of hell and he goes forth to tempt the nations and it says to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth that means he's not leaving anybody out there are, everybody's going to have a chance to either profess their faith and belief in Christ or to believe a lie. And that'll be their decision. We talked about that last week. But when it refers to the four quarters of the earth, it gives us two names, Gog and Magog. And his purpose in deceiving them, we see, is to gather them together to battle. And the number of those that were deceived, not counting, right? this is only the ones that decided to follow Satan, says that they number as the sands on the seashore right plenty of people but it says that he goes to tempt the nations the four quarters of the earth and then we get two names Gog and Magog now Ezekiel refers to Gog in his prophecies okay and then Magog is a name that you're going to find that's the oldest son of Noah's oldest son I don't necessarily know for certain that he was the oldest grandchild but he was the oldest son of Noah's oldest son. Okay. Magog is generally attributed to settling northeast and his descendants being in the northeastern regions of Israel. Okay. Also, presume parts of Europe. Now, the thing to note there give me an example throughout the entire Bible where the enemies of Israel came from the northeast. Right in the lands, we've got them coming from the east. We've got them coming from Babylon and Syria and the Medes and the Persians. We've got them coming from the west. That would be Rome that came and occupied. Right? We've got them from the south. That would be Egypt. Okay? Plenty of places you don't see many enemies coming from the northeast. Right now, my interpretation of that would be that these are the people. Right? They're descendants of the 144,000. All of them are God's chosen people. They're all Jews. Okay, but these are the people that you would least expect to believe a lie. 
And if you've been in church for any length of time, you can sympathize with that feeling. Wait a second, they dropped out of church? What do I mean? You mean that person did this? That person said this about the other person? Right? It never hurts when the person that you expected to betray you betrays you. But if you had an eye on them all along, you saw it coming. It's the ones that you thought never would. Well, they'll never be a problem. Right? They're just steadfast. They're the same. But, as the Bible tells us, no man knoweth his own heart, let alone another man's heart. But also, Gog is referred to as the prince, right, of his people. Magog. Magog's a nation. Okay, Gog is the prince of those people. Now, Magog, if we were to paint a picture for you, it says that they went up, in verse number 9, on the breadth of the earth and compassed, about the, camp of the, uh, compassed the camp of the saints about and the beloved city. There's enough of them that they decide that they don't want to be a part of Christ's kingdom. They set up their own country. And through prophecy, it's shown to be a nation which is called Magog. They've got a prince. His name's Gog. Now, I find it no coincidence that Gog says, really close to God. Right? The world's always trying to imitate. Can't duplicate. They say, we don't want Christ as our king. We want Gog as our prince. He will be our leader. And there's enough of them that it says that it can pass as the camp of the saints round about. How many of the saints are left? I don't know. But there's enough of the other ones that they can circle them all around. And it says not only them, it says the city. That's Jerusalem. That's where Christ is. They say, with the people that we've got on our side, with our new prince that we've put in power, we can circle them, whether it's a war of attrition or whether we, you know, siege the city. Eventually, they're going to have to give up. Now, keep in mind, this is a group of people that for a thousand years, or however long they've been alive, there have been no problems under Christ's rule and reign. Everything's been wonderful. Until Satan's loose, when Christ is demonstrating the authority that he has, right? there's no sin. There are no problems. There's no strife. No one's unsatisfied. Why? Because Christ does all things well. But yet, when given a chance... The devil goes out and he deceived the nations. You know what I mean? He told them a lie. And with no evidence to back up what the devil's telling them, they still believe something that they've seen for their entire lives is not true. Then they decide, after hearing for a thousand years, this is the king of kings, lord of lords. This is the lamb. This is our rock. Right? This is faithful and true. His name is Wonderful Counselor, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Right? He came and set up this kingdom just for you so that you might have peace, so that you might actually dwell on the earth with Him. He came back and set up this kingdom so you could be born. After hearing all of that, they still junk it. Now, don't throw off on them. Adam and Eve were in the same boat. They still believed a lie. Now, you say, Brother Jordan, how can that happen? People are people. Right? If you're being honest today, you've had instances in your life where everything in front of you said not to do it, but you did it anyway. It's no different. Maybe some, like Lucifer, didn't like calling somebody else Lord. They wanted to be the Lord of their lives. There's a lot of people throughout the Bible that wouldn't submit, and as a result of it, they became the enemy of God. This is the same situation. 
But what it all boils down to is that there are those that make themselves the enemies of God. I'll remind you, nowhere in the Bible has God ever made something and called it his enemy. Go back to Genesis. Everything he made, the Lord saw that it was what good, not evil. When God made Lucifer, Lucifer was made well. He was made good. The Bible talks about man being fearfully and wonderfully made in the image of God. That our very life was breathed into us by God. God doesn't make junk. God never made someone to become evil so that they could be his enemy. Anyone that has ever been opposed to God has done that to themselves. You say, well, Brother Jordan, we were conceived in sin, born in sin. Right? We didn't have a choice. You, you had a choice. You were sinners by nature, but you were also sinners by trade. And when the Holy Ghost revealed that to you, you fell under conviction and repented of your sin and accepted Christ as your Savior. These people, far more than any of us, they've seen with their very eyes and lived for a thousand years in the presence of Almighty God, and they still reject Him. Right? We know in part, but we believe fully through faith. These people will have seen, but yet they have not seen what makes the Son of God precious. Right, to quote the Santa Claus movie. Right, seeing is not believing. Believing is seeing. Some people will never believe that he is what he says he is. With all the evidence in front of them, they'll never believe it. Even if everything else is taken away, at the first chance to believe in something different, they will. Say, why is that? Because man has a choice. If I could explain to you why man does all that man does in this world, right, I'd be able to make a whole lot of money writing books. But even if we knew the truth, we know that the truth is because of sin, that man chooses to partake in sin, and as a result of it, we've got to bear the, or reap the fruit of sin. But how this world has spun out of course, how can man come up with the wickedness that you know, man has come up with the persecutions and the hatred. I can't explain that. All I can tell you is that any of us are apt to do it. It's only by the grace of God that we have it. But it says that they circled the saints and the beloved city, and they don't even get to fight. We've already talked about the battle of Armageddon where Jesus comes out of heaven. He lands on the Mount of Olives, splits it in half. Right, the sharp sword comes out of his mouth. There's no battle here. See, at the battle of Armageddon, God came back to deliver his people. Right, to rescue them. He promised that he would fight their fights for them. Go back into the Old Testament, that if they believed, that they stayed faithful to God, that if they gave God their best and then trusted that he'd handle the rest, that God would fight their battles for them. Well, in the battle of Armageddon, they're incapable of defending themselves. Right? There is no Joshua that they can look to and say, go lead the army out. There's only 144,000 left against the entire world. You could give the, the guys on the other side slingshots and they'd still lose. Well, what are you saying, Brother Jordan? Here, there's no battle to deliver God's people. They're all God's chosen people. They're all over the 144,000. Why isn't there a battle to prove that God's right? Because these people had indisputable proof for a thousand years. And yet they still chose to reject God. They don't get Jesus showing up on a white horse to deliver them. Because the people that are inside of the city, they're in the city. They're behind walls. They don't need to be defended. They're safe in the arms of Christ. Why does fire come down out of heaven? 
Why isn't there any great battle? Because that fire is a picture of God's judgment. Anytime that you see fire coming down out of heaven, it's a symbol of God's judgment. It's a symbol of God's power. It is to prove His omnipotence. What did He rain down on Sodom and Gomorrah? Fire and brimstone. What did He consume the sacrifice of Elijah with off, on top of the mountain? Fire out of heaven. What did He take Elijah up in? A whirlwind of fire. Right? It's always to demonstrate that God has full power and full control. Well, He's shown them that for a thousand years and they still believed the lie and then they saw how much power He had. They were given their choice. They made themselves the enemy of God, not God's people. They may have thought they were going to war with the people behind the wall, but God said, no, you've got to fight me. And they stood no chance. Why? Because the very next verse says that the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are. Remember, they already got thrown in there. Shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. And I saw a great white throne. Just one verse to the next. We don't know the time between when fire falls down from heaven, when they go and take Satan and cast him into a lake of fire. I don't know the time period. But as we read it, there's just one word that separates them, and. But it says, and I saw a great white throne. And him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and heaven fled away. God sits down upon the, we've already talked about the judgment seat of Christ. This is the great white throne of judgment. At the judgment seat of Christ, he sat down and judged the saints for the deeds that they did after they were saved. We weren't judged for sin at the judgment seat of Christ. We were judged for the works that we did after we got saved how good of a steward we were, if you remember when we talked about it, of what Christ entrusted us with. When God sits down upon the great white throne of judgment, it is to judge sin. We don't have to stand before this throne because we were judged for sin at Calvary. The blood was applied to our account. Christ stood up and as our intercessor, as our mediator said, it's already been paid for, Father, look at my hands. Look at my side. Look at my feet. They're engraved in me. They're a part of me, and I'm a part of them. Then he says, then they've already paid the cost for their sin. You didn't pay it. Christ paid it for you, but God considered the bill paid. Well, when God sits down upon the great white throne of judgment, what happens? It says that the earth and heaven flood away from his face. See, this throne has always been somewhere. Whether it's in heaven, whether God has it someplace, out in the middle of nowhere, beyond creation, I don't know. But it has always existed. It's only by the mercy and the grace of God that He has not sat on that throne until this verse. God has always had the right to sit down upon the great white throne of judgment. God has always had the choice and the opportunity to do it. But He suffered the insult that sin was and the enmity that was put between God and His creation because He knew if He sat down on this throne before you had a chance to believe in Christ that there would have been no hope for you. Out of God's love and compassion, He has not sat on that throne. We know that he's seated on a throne in heaven because when Stephen looked up into heaven, what did it say? That he saw the Son standing at the right hand of the Father. That Christ is seated next to the Father on the right hand of the Father. Other places in the Bible tells us. God's got a throne, but this throne is the throne of judgment. Now, think of it this way. You remember when they crucified Christ and it said that Pilate sat in the judgment seat Pilate had a house Pilate had a home I'm sure that Pilate had an office somewhere there was a building that he conducted business in in each one of those places there was a seat that was his 
Right? If I were to come over to your house, you've got your chair. Right? That's where you sit. Right? Everybody that comes in knows, hey, if it, especially at family reunions and that kind of stuff, right? Family Christmases. The oldest gentleman gets the recliner. Everybody knows that. Right? That's just, that's grandpa's seed. That's so and so seed. Don't mess with that seed. Right? That's their throne. Right, but see, God's got a throne where he rules and reigns with omnipotence, with omnipresence, with all knowledge. Right? That's the throne that's in the sides of the north that we read about in the Bible. But there's also a seat where God sometimes sits, or one day will sit, where he takes care of judgment, that business. At the marriage supper of the Lamb, I'm sure that the Father has a seat somewhere. Right, he's got a throne where he can sit. That's his chair. But there are multiple thrones. The judgment seat of Christ. What's that? That's another throne. Well, it says here that he sits on the great white throne of judgment. And when he sits on the great white throne of judgment, why does heaven and earth flee away from his face? Because when he sits on that throne, it has to be evident that he has the authority to sit on that seat. You don't respect a judgment if you think that the person handing down the judgment isn't trustworthy or isn't knowledgeable. Why do you think all these books are laid out before people? To show that he knows what he's saying. When you walk into a courtroom today, you know why a judge wears a robe? It's not because that's still in fashion. Okay? It is to distinguish that that person's in charge. It's to show that there's something adorning them that sets them apart from just another onlooker in the courtroom or one of the attorneys. Now, that's a symbol of their authority. Right? Well, when God sits down on the great white throne of judgment... Right? He has to reveal who he really is. And when he does, even heaven and earth can't stand before him. Everything fades away because they know that it's not worthy to stand before God. Well, it says that there was found no place for them. Talking about heaven and earth. That I... It's sad, but it's almost comical when people say, well, I'm sure that when I stand before God, I'll be able to explain. No. There's not even a place for heaven, let alone earth, when God sits upon this throne. You say, well, if there is nothing, what are you standing on? You're standing on the will of God before the throne of God. There's nothing else to keep you there other than God's will. Then let me just clarify, that's all God needs. God doesn't need anything. But it says in verse number 12, I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. Now who are the dead? That's everybody. Well, who's everybody? Well, look at verse number 13. It says, The sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged, every man according to their works. Who is it? Anyone that has ever died outside of Christ. You want me to... This is just a little fun fact for you. In the New Testament, after somebody gets saved, give me an example in the Word of God where after somebody graduates to heaven after somebody is no longer here to be absent with the bodies to be present with the Lord give me an example where the Bible refers to them people as dead you can't the apostle Paul said that those which sleep in Christ we will not prevent them that sleep he said during the rapture right in fact from the moment that you are born again, doesn't the Bible say that you've been made alive? 
You were dead in trespasses to sin. But Christ came to give you life, make you alive, and life more abundantly. You can't be counted as one of the dead if you've been saved by Christ. By this point in time, through the book of Revelation, you've been made alive forevermore with the body like Christ. Right, The spirit in you that received that newness of life has received the body that will be alive forevermore. There is no way that you can be considered dead. In God's eyes, all you did was make a wardrobe change. It's all that it was. The only people that are alive are those that are in Christ. The other ones are just waiting for the death sentence to be carried out. They're dead men walking spiritually speaking so when it says that the dead stood before the great white throne of the judgment that excludes anybody that has received Christ as their savior those that were still faithful the hundred, of the 144,000 and their descendants guess what they get they get what we got they receive the same thing that we have they're not dead Christ put chains upon death and hell during the millennial reign he shut them up they were only reopened for a short space when God sent that fire out of heaven to destroy those that believed the lie. Who's standing before the great white throne of judgment? Those that stayed dead in their trespasses, in their sins. They may have had a mortal life, but spiritually they were always dead. And they died in their sins. What's that mean? It means that they were always dead. Just because they drew breath doesn't mean that you're alive in the eyes of God. You were saved from death when Christ saved you. You weren't just saved from hell. Why do you think the Bible says that the sting of death has been taken away from believers? Because the sting of death was part of the pain and the punishment of sin. If your sins have been forgiven, there's no more sting. Why? Because it's not a punishment anymore. It's just a part of the aging process for a Christian to get rid of this corrupt thing so that we can receive the new purified thing. Right? A body like Christ's. Well, it says that the dead stand before the great white throne of judgment. It's a small and great. Who's that? That's everybody. And then it says, and the books were open, plural. What are those books? Well, I don't know how many of them are. I just know there's more than one. And in theory, we know that there's at least three. Follow with me. And the books were open, and another book was open. So we've at least got two, plus another one over here. This one, the one that was opened up second, we're told is the book of life. A book of the names of those that are recorded as receiving Christ. Okay, we know what that, that's what this book is. Well, what are these books? Well, I imagine that there's about 66 of them that we know about. I know that there's a half written in heaven that we don't even know yet. I dare to say that if it's half that we don't know, there'd be at least another 66. What are those books? Those are the books of God's law. Those are the books of what it takes to be righteous, to be holy. It's the commandments that God gave for what God expected and found acceptable. It's everything that Christ fulfilled so that you wouldn't have to. I believe in those books there will be a record of every time that every person had an opportunity to hear the name of Jesus or heard the gospel. I believe in those books it's recorded every sin that every one of those individuals were guilty of. But see, those books are just evidence. That's not what God bases His judgment off of. Those books are to show those that are going through it 
that they were wrong. That's proof for those that are standing before God. There's only one book that God cares about. What are you saying, Brother Jordan? I'm saying, verse number 15, And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. God kept all those records for all of time. God preserved all of His commandments. Not for His sake. God only needs one book. It was the book that Jesus loosed them seals of. It's the book that the Lamb had. That the Lamb was recording names of those that put their faith and trust in Him. It's a record of those that God knows. Are we not told that on that day, many will hear, depart from me, ye that work iniquity, I never knew you? The book of life is a record of who God doesn't know. All those other books are to prove to those people without a doubt that they deserve what God's getting ready to sentence them to. Those books have every answer recorded to stop all of their excuses. I believe that the first book that people are going to thumb through is the book of life. They're going to go however God has it sorted. And they're going to look for their name, and it's not going to be there. Then they're going to try to justify to God why they deserve to be in that book. And they're going to go through the other books. And they're, got, they're not going to find any hope in any of them. It'll be a sad day. I'll remind you that it hadn't been written yet that comes after this point where God wipes away all tears from their eyes. I don't know, but I imagine Christ may stand and testify to the fact that because of how much He loved them, He fulfilled all those books and they rejected Him. I wonder if the Savior in love and compassion will shed tears that they chose to go to the lake of fire. I don't know. But I know that tears will still be around. It's going to be a hard day, even for the saints. Because you're going to have to watch those that you invested in, that you tried to share the gospel with, that you, as a faithful servant, went and spread the seed. And you hate the fact that it fell upon fallow ground, that they would not receive it. God may have sent you to water something that somebody else planted, but yet it never took root. It's going to be a regretful day. It's going to be a day of agony. Because each one that stands before him and can't find their name in the book of life, which is all of the dead, none of the dead are in the book of life. Why? Because they're dead. They haven't been given life. They never received life will have to hear as they're cast into the lake of fire. Devil doesn't get an appointment at the judgment or the great white throne of judgment. He already got thrown in. Go back to verse number ten. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone. He doesn't get a judgment day. He got judged a long time ago. He knew he was wrong. That's why he's trying to take as many people with him. He gets cast into the lake of fire, but then we have to watch as each soul is cast off. Well, what kind of torments the devil going to be in? It says, and shall be tormented at the end of verse number 10, day and night, forever and ever. We're going to have to hear them as they are subjected to the judgment for their sin. We're going to have to look as people that had hope realize that all their hope was a lie. We're going to have to look at people as they accept the fact that they're the reason that they are being cast into the lake of fire. Those that may be in this life were good people when it comes to the world standards. They've been loving people, kind people, giving people. 
but yet they thought they didn't need Jesus. We're going to have to hear people beg for one more chance, knowing that they don't deserve it. And we're going to have to hear God say, throw them into the lake of fire. He's going to go to a certain page in a book and say, I gave you this chance and this chance and this chance and this chance. He said, no more chances. But it says, verse number 12, that the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. That's where we get that one of them is going to be God's standards. And the other one's going to be their works. I don't know how long it's going to take for all the dead to be judged. But I can promise you that by the end of it, it's going to take its toll on everybody. I'll remind you that those that you were, by the will of God, intended to go and win, their blood will be required at your hands on that day. God may command you to throw the one that you were supposed to witness to, supposed to reach out to, supposed to be a light in their life. And because you chose not to, you'll have to execute God's judgment. I wonder how many people will have to escort to the lake of fire. Is that they were cast into the lake. You'll have to forcibly throw them into the because they don't want to. I wonder if you'll hear, how come you didn't love me enough to tell me the truth? If you knew the answer, why didn't you tell me? Why were you ashamed of the best thing that ever happened to you? What did I do to deserve your hatred? Why didn't you share what you were supposed to share? And all the while, you know that you're walking them to what? Everlasting pain and torment. I wonder if people on that day will say to those that they're casting into the lake of fire, I'm sorry. I don't know. But I know that each one of us are going to have a part. Even if we're called as witnesses, to, as God says, tell them all the times that you told them about Jesus. You're going to have a part. But everything that we do on that day, there will be no joy in it. There will be no elation. There will be no shouting on that day. There will only be weeping. There will be wailing. There will be the sounds of those that are being cast into everlasting torment. Then it says, verse number 14, death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. Hell, the place that was originally intended as a stopgap to inflict punishment upon the devil and his angels. A place that nowadays... Even secular people know to fear a place called hell. That it's lit with fire and flames. That's just entered into the zeitgeist, if you will, of society. That hell is a place of torment. A place that was meant to torment is going to be cast into a place of greater torment. And then after all of the dead are cast, into the lake of fire, or at the same time, I do not know. But death itself will be cast into the lake of fire. Why? Because from that day forward, there will be no more dead. We are alive forevermore. Once the dead have been brought before God, there's no more reason for death. Did it ever occur to you that God didn't make death? Man did. When man sinned, God told him, the day that you eat of the fruit of that tree, ye shall surely die. God didn't make death. 
Man's sin created death. Without sin, there never would have been death. Without disobedience to God's commandments, there never would have been a thing that caused us to be separated from God. Well, the thing that separates this flesh from God is death. And God will cast it off into the lake of fire as something that He never intended for man to ever deal with. And death itself will be tormented forevermore. But when death and hell are cast away, people know that there's no place that they can be hid from the wrath of God. There's no place that they can say, well, Lord, can you just put me over there? Don't throw me in the lake. No, He already threw them in. There's only two places, the book of life or the lake of fire. And, verse number 15, And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. I find it fitting that the same word is used in verse number 15 as over in Romans 10, 13. Whosoever calleth upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You know what whosoever means? It means anybody that chooses. It means anyone. We're taught that, but whosoever shall call. That means anyone that wants to. Do you know why someone won't accept Christ as their Savior? Because they don't want to. They don't want to believe. They don't want to repent. They don't want to, quote-unquote, lose all the things that they would lose in the eyes of the world in order to gain Christ. Fear of loss is greater than fear of gain. You know, those that after the millennial reign turn their back on God, you know why? Because whosoever chose to believe a lie. Whosoever means anyone, but it also means everyone. There's no escape from that phrase. Everyone that calls upon the name of the Lord gets saved. They call on the Lord the way that God said to call on the Lord. But everybody that's not found in the book of life, there's no escape. There's no exception. I'm thankful that we can sing song 444 today, Brother Ray. I've got a mansion. I've got a place. We're going to hear about that city. We're going to hear about what he's gone to prepare for them that love him. We're going to hear about it. But that day is a day where all those that don't have a place are going to find out where their residence will be for all of eternity. Did you know that you could receive a daily devotion every morning in your inbox? Head on over to ibcflorence.com and click on Daily Devotions to sign up today. And as always, thanks for listening.